So a lot of problems in machine learning are discrete in nature. For instance, uh, if you look at semantic segmentation, you're given an image and then you have to say which parts of the image belong to which objects. So you have to assign a class to each pixel. Then there are problems like stereo correspondence where given two images which are kind of similar. You would like to map a pixel in the first image to an XY coordinate in the other image. Now, when problems are discrete in nature, they, uh, they give rise to very hard optimization problems. And if you know a little bit about the field, you know that a lot of problems in this field tend to be NP-hard. So how do we go about solving these problems? That's the focus of my research. Now, in general, if you, are just, if you just know that we have a discrete optimization problem, then we are kind of lost because uh, then we, have, we are stuck with NP-hardness. But oftentimes, we look for special structure in the problem. And submodularity or submodular functions are one such special structure. Um, and these functions, they occur not just in machine learning, but also in economics and game theory. And they are very widely prevalent. And they have some nice properties which like, lend them suitable for these applications. So let me give you uh, an intuition about what these functions are. Consider the sensor placement problem. We have a room. And we would like to place, let's say, five sensors in that room. And we have a limit. We don't want to use a lot of sensors. So we want to use as few sensors as possible, but we want to cover the area as well, such that if, let's say, there is a fire in one part, we get an alarm very quickly. So this is the sensor placement problem. Cover the whole area using as few sensors as possible. Formally, we can state this problem as, let's say I have a ground set, which is all the possible locations in which I could put the sensors in. And there's a set function which tells me that given this configuration of sensor placement, what is the utility or how much benefit I'm getting out of this one, out of this placement of sensors? So if the, util if the function value is large, it means that this placement is very good. But if the function value is small, then we don't want that placement. And oftentimes, you assume in these problems that if you have a null set, meaning that you have placed no sensor at all, then there's zero utility. And this is, um, it's, there's no loss of generality here. And we also assume going forward that we have a black box oracle, which given a set, it tells you what the utility or what the function value is. So let's try to get a, a better intuition of the problem. What do we want a submodular function to model what is it that we ask of it? So let's say if I have a sensor placement in the first setting here, which is, covers the entire floor plan, then it's good. Because this sensor, this placement, it's informative. But on the other hand, if they are like concentrated in one particular region, then there's a lot of redundancy in that. And um, this, this configuration doesn't give us much of information, and it has less utility. So we want our function to model this kind of behavior, that if there is a nice configuration, we want it to have high value and low for a bad configuration. Now, a concept which, which is used to characterize some modular functions is called marginal gain which is that, let's say currently I have two sensors already placed. What is the additional benefit which I get out of adding another sensor? So let's say new sensor X3 here is a new element S, and the, a is the current set which I have is the set of two sensors. Then what is the benefit, additional benefit, which I get out of adding the third sensor? It's the union of the whole thing minus what was the set without the element which I'm adding. And this is the property which characterizes some modular function, and that makes it so useful in different fields. It's the property of diminishing gains. So let's say that I have, at this moment, two sensors placed in my flow. Then I'll get more benefit out of adding a new sensor, because I, this, will, this has a scope of covering more, more area. 
But let's say if I'm adding it to a configuration where there are already a lot of sensors, then uh, the new sensor is unlikely to give me more information because the area is already being covered by um, the sensors which are already present. So this is called diminishing returns in the sense that if I add an element to a smaller set, I am likely to get more benefit, more utility, as compared to if I add the same element to a larger set. And formally it is stated like this, that let's say you have two sets, you have a big set B and you have a small subset A, and we want to add an element S to it, then the marginal benefit of adding the element to the smaller set A is more than the marginal benefit of adding it to the set B. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt, even in middle. So this is what some modular functions are, and here what we would want to do is we would want to find that set or that placement of sensors which will give me maximum utility. And this is the sensor placement problem. Now, if you know something about the set cover problem, then you can map this thing as a set cover problem. And we know that set cover problems are NP hard to solve. So similarly, maximizing this submodular function is NP hard. But these functions have a very nice property that minimizing them is tractable, it's feasible. And they have a lot of nice applications. And one of them, which I'm showing it, showing here, is from the domain of computer vision. Uh, maybe you are familiar with it, but let, it will help us set the notation going forward. So, What I want to do is, given an image, I want to segment out the part which belongs to the foreground. So for instance, here, this frame is the foreground, and the rest of it is background. And the way I'm going to do it is, I'm going to model the image as a graphical model with the set of x's being the pixel values which I observe, and the set of z variables, they are binary, 0 or 1, in, uh, like indicator vectors for foreground or background. And given the, um, or rather, sorry, it's the other way around, z is, stands for the pixel values and x for whether it's foreground or um, background. So given, the, given an image, given the pixel values, I would like to find the most likely assignment of 0, 1 values to get the segmentation as foreground or background. And this is called a uh, map inference problem in, in graphical models, meaning that you want to find an assignment of, to the variables x which has the highest probability. And in practice, oftentimes, this posterior function, this posterior probability is specified as an energy function. So to maximize the probability, I can instead minimize the energy function. So now you see like we have a discrete optimization problem here. Um, so x is the vector of 0, 1 assignments, and I want to minimize my function e such that I get a good, um, oops, sorry. So minimizing the function e will give me a good segmentation of foreground and background. Now, in general, although we know that some modular minimization is easy, meaning that we can do it in polynomial time, but it is unlikely to scale very well for computer vision problems. So if you think of it, uh, in general, some modular minimization takes order n raised to the power of 5 time, and that is too much for computer vision applications where we are probably dealing with millions of pixels. So it doesn't scale very well. And then we try to think, is there any additional structure in the submodular function such that I can solve it more quickly? Um, and thankfully, uh, there is an additional structure in the energy functions because the way these are typically specified is the energy function is a summation of two terms. The first is these are called the unit terms which model the data likelihood, meaning that given the RGB values of the pixels, what is its uh, probability of taking the zero or one value? And the second term, it's like a prior, and it, 
it helps us to obtain it really helps us to obtain very smooth labelings. So if we were just to use the first term, that then we would end up with noisy labelings, which we do not want. But the second term helps us to smooth out um, and give us cleaner segmentations. So here's the uh, submodular minimization problem which we want to solve. And oftentimes, the condition under which um, my energy function is submodular is if you um, if you take the marginal diminishing returns property, then it it could it will translate to this uh, this thing where for pixels i and j, the energy of these configuration, the sum of these is more than the other two configuration. And what this means is that submodular functions they they tend to prefer cooperation or similarity. So they tend to prefer configurations where variables take similar values as compared to when they take distinct, distinct values. And this is what leads, this is these, these factors in the pairwise terms, they lead to nice segmentations of the foreground and background. So if we have a if we have this kind of structure to my energy function and if they if each term in the energy function obeys this property of cooperation then i can represent my energy function as a graph and what this means is that i can do submodular minimization using graph cuts uh, i won't go into details of it but i can give you a reference as to how an energy function is represented as a graph but um, but we have very fast solvers for graph cuts. So if we can pose this minimization problem as a graph cut, minimum ST cut in a graph, then we are, um, then it helps a lot. So these algorithms scale very well with large inputs and graph cut, prop, graph cut formulations of these energy minimization problem has had a big impact in computer vision. Uh, like these days, computer vision tends to be driven a lot by neural networks. But before the advent of these, graph cuts played a major role in all kind of lot of computer vision problems like segmentation or uh, stereo correspondence. These, so it's a central concept in 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 computer vision. Now, this is where my research comes in. That we looked at we looked at energy functions and we saw that if there is a special structure um, that the energy term is composed of unity terms and pairwise terms then i can i can represent it by a graph and use fast uh, graph cut solvers but we find that often these these kind of representation of my problem as unary and pairwise they have severe limitations and what this means is they are not representative enough. So look at this problem that given an image, uh, here we are trying to do segmentation, not foreground and background, but multi-class segmentation. And if I look at the segmentation here, it's good, but it's not really accurate. For instance, this part which has been zoomed in the original picture, it contains a tower which is not present in my segmented image. So we need something more than just the pairwise term, and we need some kind of higher order information rather than just pair interaction between pair of uh, pixels or variables. So, so what we instead do is we consider cliques. We take the image, we break it up into super pixels, which are regions which are homogeneous in appearance, and then we have an additional term in the energy function, which uh, which tries to prefer assignments in which variable in pixels in a clique they tend tend to take similar values. So these are super pixels, and if we have these higher order information as well, then um, we observe that it leads to much more accurate segmentation, and even the tower is re represented well. So it's nice to include the higher order information in the energy function, but can we still represent it using graphs and uh, can we still solve the energy minimization fast using graph cuts? 
So the, in, the answer is yes, in some cases, but not in general. So for general, for general functions of uh, clique potentials, it's not graph representable, but there are specific cases in which I can do it. So when we when we introduce higher order functions, then um, one the, this reference shows that what are the class of higher order potentials for which I could represent it using graph cuts. But also there are we also need to get, give approximation guarantees, which means that let's say I I do represent it as a graph cut, and I solve that optimization problem. But it's not exact energy minimization; it's approximate energy minimization then what can we say about the quality of the approximate solution? So typically, we, um, we try to give some kind of approximation factors for as a guarantee, meaning that let's say I, um, my, minima, my minimum value is 2. Then if my approximation factor is, let's say, 3, then my algorithm is guaranteed to give me a solution which doesn't have an, which has an energy which is not more than Six. So it kind of guarantees you that my solution from the approximation algorithm cannot be arbitrarily bad. Um, so yeah, this is the kind of thing which uh, I work on. And recently, I've, so this is an example of some modular minimization problem. Recently, I started working on uh, some modular maximization problems which if you remember from the discussion of sensor placements, is an NP hard problem. So we tried to tackle it using approximate methods. And um, yeah, it's still a work in progress. And I'll discuss it at a later point of time. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>